and I'd like to start by, um, by stating with gratitude that we are on the Coast Salish territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people, and that we are on lands that continue to experience oppression, injustices, including colonial violence. And it takes an active commitment to work against forms of marginalization um, and oppression both that we do and don't personally experience. In the words of Maya Angelou, no one, no one of us can be free until everyone is free. So from Turtle Island to Palestine, let's continue to be active against the colonial injustices and human rights violations, especially right now in mm. free Palestine. Also, so lovely to see everyone here today with masks. Super appreciated um, to have events that are able to be uh, masked. And I have another accessibility request that um, for folks who are uh, electro electromagnetic sensitive, have electromagnetic sensitivity. Bleh, um, if anyone who doesn't need their phones or devices on could either power down, not just silent. Uh, or put it on airplane mode um, with both Bluetooth and Wi-Fi off. That would be greatly appreciated for the event. So the Little Gallery is a project, this, this ongoing event and art series, um, is a project to fulfill the mission of Cross and Crows Books as a queer space supporting queer creative, queer creators, especially QT BIPOC authors and artists. And the Little Art Gallery events are organized by me, Taz Salas. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, and so uh, the feature artist for this month here who has lovely pieces that will be is are the display for the entire month. There's also some of his work throughout, like there's stickers and small postcards. Um, so I'm going to read his bio. Um, Jasper Barenholt is a Indigi queer artist from Silk Okanagan Nation. Throughout his BFA undergraduate studies at UBC, from the Okanagan campus to the art scene of Vancouver, Jasper found inspiration in themes of heritage, community, and queer identity. He has been open about his involvement with the 2S LGBTQ community for over a decade, including being, one, being out as a transgender man for five, years of the, five of those years. Now in his graduate year, he works mainly in oil painting, but still loves exploring other mediums. He has experience working in the animation industry for two years in Kelowna. He has exhibited his work in six different cities across BC, and plans on expanding that even further. You can visit him on Instagram and his website, shrimp underscore storyteller is on Instagram, and Jasper, B-E-R-E-H-U-L-K-E dot com is his website, and you can find around this space one of his lovely pieces. Um, he also has for sale at the front for, um, that we were brought in for the month. Some little stickers that say the Trans Day of Remembrance say their name, and they are $2 each, and uh, those are before the uh, Trans Day of Remembrance that is on the 20th this month, and that there's events around the city um, related to that. Yeah. So now for the wonderful poetry and stories that uh, of the people that are here today, um, would you like me to read your bio? Sure. Sounds good. <laughs> so Kathleen P. Lamont is a white, able-bodied, kinky femme transsexual performing artist living with a simultaneous gift curse of an ADHD brain. <laughs> she currently resides on unceded Coast Salish territories, Vancouver, after having been raised in occupied Mohawk, Montreal, and Algonquin, Ottawa territories but she's not pissing off the gaijoisie or aiming her hyper-focused superpowers towards dense journal articles about cognitive neuroscience 
She can be found going to 12-step meetings, getting tattooed, practicing mindfulness and compassion, med compassion meditations, and ultimately challenging people's notions about what is a good or respectable trans woman. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Thanks. Uh, yeah, cool. Hey, everyone. Uh, hey. This is awesome to see lots of folks here. Um, I, uh, yeah, I've done a lot of different uh, things in my life as an artist, like done a lot of poetry readings. I feel like every, so basically like every uh, five to seven years or so, I go in like deep diving into like a new art form and like so I did a lot of poetry when I was a teenager and then my like early 20s I did like performance art and then got really into music and was in a bunch of bands and DJed a bunch and the last like five years or so has been switching more to like um, writing in terms of not poetry but like uh, fiction and non-fiction essays all that kind of stuff uh, so I've been working on a novel um, the last year, uh, and it's really, really rough right now, like, uh, this is like the, o I'm going to read a piece from it that is basically the only piece that is ready to see the light of day, because otherwise it's like pretty messy, um, and I'm only like about a third of a way through right now, um, but, uh, yeah, uh, so basically, um, if you were to like pick up the novel, you know, and read like the back of it, like, what is this going to be all about? I thought I'd maybe give you just a brief overview before I actually jump into like a scene. Um, so this is like what you would read on the back of a blurb or something, you know. Um, tired of drifting, oh, the, the novel is called Trans Fabulosity. <laughs> uh, tired of drifting through life, Vivian O'Toole, a queer sex working trans dyke with ADHD, decides she's going to find purpose in life by organizing a trans arts festival and conference. Seven people respond to her call for fellow organizers, forming a motley collective of wildly diverse personalities, backgrounds, and politics, from radical anarchist BIPOC genderqueers all the way to stealth, binary, white trans people who regularly vote for the Conservative Party. Suffice it to say, the storming and forming stages of their group dynamics are epic. Once the group has finally cohered and the festival slash conference prep begins in earnest, then they have to do battle with TERFs who try to shut them down, online fascist trolls who dox them, CSIS and RCMP agents who try to infiltrate them, and a right-wing reactionary media ecosystem who can't stop lying about them. Will they be able to pull off the trans-fabulous event, or will the group collapse under the weight of internal and external dynamics? Buy this book to find out now. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the like, um, that's the background of like what this book is about. And so basically, I'm going to read a piece from the very opening scene that gets at the like very first part of that description of tired of drifting through life. So it's kind of an introduction to the main character. Um, yeah, so here we go. Uh, it's really quite amazing how bored one can get, even when you've got a client bent over a spanking bench and you're flogging them with the inner tube tire that you made, the flogger that you made on a whim five years ago, Vivian thought to herself as she talked to her sixth client that day. That's how Vivian liked to work though. Over the past few years, She'd settled into a fairly regular schedule, where she would book the dungeon space for two full days in a row, and then for those two days, she would spend 12 to 16 hours a day being the best pro-dom that she knew how to be. To others, her work schedule might seem kind of intense, but to her, it worked with her ADHD brain's tendency to seemingly operate in only two modes. A, 1,000% on, go, 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 energy, Energizer Bunny style, and B, plopped on the couch for days, barely mustering the energy to feed herself or take a shower. Two brain styles. <laughs> she would work for two full days, followed by two full days of recovery slash self-care, with three days left every week to do the things that sustained her, such as volunteering at the trans youth drop-in, going to queer punk shows in dingy East End basements, or dropping in for a night of good food, great gossip, and even better pampering at the monthly beauty night that, at Pace, one of the Vancouver's organizations by and for sex workers. And like most other sex workers that Vivian knew, she had a potpourri of clients with different flavors, pro proclivities, kinks, and fetishes. About a quarter of them were regulars, while maybe three quarters were one-offs. There were the guys who loved the sharp, stingy sensations of wax candles and pinwheels and the fiery ends of single-tail whips. And there were the guys who were more into the thuddy type of pain that came from being punched and kicked and 
spanked with their fraternity titles that they held on since their college days. <laughs> but either way, sharp or thuddy, they all paid Vivian good money for the privilege of being humiliated by her. Hands down, though, Vivian's favorite clients were those guys who she was pretty sure were really just eggs, aka trans ladies just waiting to crack their shells fully open. Because all they wanted to do was ask, was pay Vivian to ask, sit around and ask her a million and five questions about trans-related topics. So, how did you know you were trans? What did starting hormones feel like? Was, was the pain of surgery really as bad as it's chalked up to be? Can I examine your new vagina close up? It was during these types of conversations, especially when the guys insisted on chatting while all dolled up in the most frilly cross-dressed attire, that Vivian was often reminded of that old, within the trans community, bad joke, bad taste joke. What's the difference between a transvestite and a transsexual? Five years, give or take. <laughs> but since those egg clients were rare, those thoughts of boredom and purposeless had been growing louder and louder. She had first noticed those inklings of ennui creeping into her life about a year ago. It happened during one of her weekly dilation sessions, about a week after her 38th birthday. It had been a fabulous birthday. Despite her general loading of surprises, Vivian's best friend Autumn had convinced the beauty night organizers to come into the space for a surprise birthday party. And Autumn went out all out too. They had decorated the place with kink-themed balloons, a cake shaped like a vulva, and games like pin the binder and pack around the trans guy. And how many wax does it take to destroy the penis-shaped pinata? Autumn's thoughtfulness with every minute detail was, had brought Vivian to sobs. So, when that general sense of malaise first arose during her dilation session, she wasn't sure if it meant anything deeper. Maybe it was just the usual post-euphoria crash that inevitably comes after returning from a really great conference or a week of traveling. In that first moment of listlessness, though, Vivian had a sense that somehow this was pointing to something deeper. Because normally the post-con crash that she was familiar with appeared right away. And then it only hung around for like a day or two, maybe three at max. This feeling, however, which felt like a sadness around the eyes and a heaviness in the shoulders and chest, like someone had wrapped a weighted blanket tightly around her, it only started emerging on day six post-birthday. Thankfully, just at the moment when Vivian had felt like she was going to be swallowed forever into that black hole of heaviness, her buddy Malcolm texted her. Hey bud, happy belated all the things. I'm thinking of going to see Strap On Punks tomorrow at the Glitter Grove. Starts at seven. It's only five bucks. See you there? Question mark. And then, oh my god, yes, Vivian replied within four seconds. And then this whole novel is going to have a lot of epistolary elements, which are like text message conversations and one whole chapter that's just like a transcript of a Discord conversation back and forth and like uh, like a Discord message board and um, podcast transcripts and like all sorts of things. So there's a whole section of like uh, back and forth the texting that I cut out because that's going to be really weird to read. <laughs> it's like, hello. You know. Um, so they text a bunch and it's great. <laughs> and then there's a poster for the Strap On Punk show that you would see on the next page being like, check it out. And then, um, next scene. Uh, she'd gone to bed shortly after the text combo with Malcolm the night before, thinking that maybe all she needed was to extinguish those embers of existential dread was a good long sleep. Around 1 p.m. the next day, however, Vivian woke from a 14-hour sleep, feeling simultaneously mentally rested but physically exhausted. Those bodily sensations of weight had not subsided. If anything, it was the opposite. They seemed to be more intense than the night before. Upon feeling that heaviness, Vivian first thought about, about texting Malcolm to bail on the show tonight. But after realizing that she still had five to six hours before she had to leave, she decided that she would try to a bunch of the arrows in her self-care self -care quiver to see if any of them helped. First one was her journal. So this is a journal entry now. <laughs> Vivian's journal entry, Saturday, July 27, 2004. 2024. Okay, so all of the self helpy slash spiritual slash witchy woo type books I've read encourage journaling to get your out, get your way through some tough shit. So voila, here I am again. Ugh. Why are habits so freaking hard to make? Wait, scratch that. Why are good habits so hard to make slash keep? 
Also, why is it that all my neuroses are so isolating? You'd think with so many of them hanging out in my head and my body, ADHD, depression, anxiety, addiction, trauma, gender shit, that somehow they'd find a way to cancel each other out or something. <laughs> like, you know, all these different things. But no, instead it's like that meme I saw the other day where all these different compounding disorders are like neighbors that share a cul-de-sac in a well-to-do neighborhood. They live in the same general area, me, but at the same time, they pretty much keep to themselves. Honestly, if I were describing the noise in my brain to someone else, I'd say it's that like this. Picture the exact harshest moment of the most grisly feedback record you own. Maybe Lou Reed's metal machine music or Harry Pussy's Let's Build a Pussy. And imagine that the same 1.5 second loop is playing ad infinitum on a locked groove on your record player. And then just when you think your head's going to explode from all that chaos between your ears, envision that you manage to muster up the energy to lift the needle off the record and this gives you a moment of calm. But when you drop the needle on a different section of the LP, you realize it's not a new song playing, rather it's the same incessant lock groove that you thought you'd just quieted. Somehow, with having just experienced that few second break in the harshness, the groove isn't as jarring and grating. It's comforting almost, but comfort and familiarity aside, you recognize it's still quite difficult to focus on anything else in your life with the screeching, scronking, siren, wail noise cutting through pretty much all facets of your existence. And ultimately, that's the thing. Depression, while it's super isolating for me, it also is profoundly comforting, because really, change is uncomfortable. It's messy, it's unpredictable, it usually contains lots of snot rags. It's like Autumn said to me that time, being healed feels amazing, but there's simply no feeling like it. It's, it's so great to be healed. However, the, going through the process of healing fucking sucks. <laughs> but, okay, okay, okay. Enough negative energy. This is supposed to be positive journaling. No more bitching, whining, complaining. Come on, Vivian. Okay, uh, on the positive side of life's balance sheets, I'm still feeling so full of love and gratitude from last week's party. Autumn has such a big heart. I just, I wish she would see that about herself. Man, I really worry about that girl sometimes. It seems like she's falling asleep, aka nodding off from too much heroin, more and more these days. And in public places too, I don't know. I know it's not my life, but eek, I just feel so risky, especially with all the bad dope going around. How many people did we lose to, a community, to ODs last year from our community? Let's see, there was Amber, Johnny, Gage, Tanisha, Dominique, Zayden. Fuck, that's six in 12 months. Ugh, fucking hate fentanyl. Lol. Okay, so wasn't that supposed to be on the positive ready now? Uh, okay, positive. Uh, it was also a really rad seeing Bernice there. She can be kind of intense sometimes, but damn, she's seen and been through a lot. I guess the same can be said for anyone who's tw more than twice my age, lol. But she's not just like any other old person. Or maybe should I say older? Because she probably gets super catty at being called old. Haha. <laughs> but yeah, she's my elder. I mean, sure. So we don't share the same racial slash ethnic slash religious background, but whatever. The facts is that Bernice was turning tricks, getting her face sapped with those old school electrolysis machines and doing fucking amazing activism, like ACT UP and Queer Nation, decades before I was even born. I mean, she's my tranny horror activist elder. I love her, even if I can only handle her in small chunks, haha. <laughs> okay, so maybe those keep it journal evangelists were onto something. Because I'm feeling better now. Uh, like, I actually want to go to the show now. Cool. Uh, it's been literally years since I've seen this trap on Punk's play. I hope that they do that Jane County Man Enough to Be a Woman cover still. It'll still be great to see Malcolm, too. I mean, I know he was there last week, but it'd be nice to see him in a one-on-one -on -one hangout sort of way. Because I know him and Hamani are going through a bit of a rough patch now, but it'll be nice to give him space to chat about it. And if he wants to, I mean. Uh, cool. And then I included Strap On Punk's lyrics. Because <laughs> the lyric, make fake lyrics to a fake band, it's all within the universe. Uh, and I'll end with that. It's the lyrics to their song, Queers Won't Go Back. Uh, we see your macho tough guy antics, your toxic masculinity isn't a, isn't a threat to us. We see you trying to drag us back to 1954, but fuck you, it's 2024. We're not going back. We've burnt our closets. No, we're not going back. We see you to try to queer bash us, and if you're not careful, one of these days all us queers and trannies and freaking weirdos are going to bash back 
Bash back, bash back. Hell no, we're not going back. We've already burnt our closets. Now we'll burn the patriarchy. Then we'll burn cis supremacy. We're not going back. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much for your reading. <laughs> it's awesome. There was another um, reader that was going to also read here tonight, um, Sita, and um, she was just not feeling well today, so um, was not able to make it. But I'll just read their bio just to give a shout out. Yeah. Um, so Sita Gia, she they, is a queer chronic illness warrior. Her debut chapbook. Knocking on the floors, on the body's door, poems to read on the bathroom floor. Mm. Prolific Pulse Press 2021 paints a picture of what it's like to live with refractory epilepsy. They live in Vancouver with their wife and do stereotypical Vancouverite things, such as practice yoga and drink too much coffee. <laughs> Follow them on Instagram at Sita uh, Gia, S I T A G A I A underscore poetry. Yeah, nice. And, yeah, totally. <laughs> mm. And so our next uh, reader tonight is Marion Jane. Would you like me to read? Sweet. <laughs> With a focus on gender, mental health, and being an unwilling member of the working class, Marion Jane hopes to make performing poetry look E look easy in an effort to trick an audience member into reading their reading their poetry next time. Ah. <laughs> um, if it helps anyone to read along, um, I do have some extra ones. If anyone wants to read along, yeah. Uh, yeah, I am a settler and have been living here for. Uh, about 22 years on the West Coast. Um, when I started writing poetry was about when I could feel the seeds of like recognizing the sort of white supremacy all around me, raising a really white supremacist family. And so this has all been kind of, all this poetry sort of stems from finding the edges of this cage and getting upset. Um, these first two are about mental, a really terrible mental health episode. First one is called Cacophony of the House. Why the hell tell me what they think they think she thought she had thought? And the thought she thought they had thought forms microbeads along the crests forms crochet grit knots in her chest, second-guessing what she knows best. The thought they thought she thought gets bound and caught in her throat. She starts to cough and laugh and distress. Why are my thoughts such a frustrating mess? Uh, the second one is called Mind Control. Oh. Um, the second one is called Mind Control. I used to believe in mind control, an invisible battle for my soul, a struggle, I wretch, I lose my breath, who can see me struggle with this predicament? I have to laugh. It's all in my head. My body jerks with a reaction. Is that really what I said? Is that what I really think? Can you see my thoughts? Or do they just stink and you're left smelling a burning brush fire? <laughs> This is a revenge poem. It's called, And I'm Sure. And I'm sure a hyena is still conscious of his laugh, a nervous tick he has to cut his anxiety in half. In confusion, he gasps and exasperates. What kind of tyrant runs this place to be left staring at an empty face? And I'm sure an octopus struggles with its clutch, grasping at the past because it's familiar to the touch. They cannot let go, and they wonder, is this my destiny? Another sucker for that ecstasy. And I'm sure a black widow still cries about her fate, to choke the living love out of someone she embraced, 
to justify the pain, to save face, she cries out, What cursed arms I must possess, while replacing her lace the way she knows best. Um, this next poem is called Growing Pains, and it was the first poem I uh, ever wrote um, on Valentine's Day in 2005. It's called Growing Pains. I remember it was in the grocery store. I asked to see my mom's glasses and put them on for the first time, for the fun of it. Mom, Mom, I can see everything. Well, son, looks like we need to get you glasses. And I remember it was over a summer that I would wake up in the night with excruciating leg pain. My mom took me to the doctor. Well, son, looks like you've got growing pains. It hurts, but it stops eventually. And I remember the time, uh, first time jumping off of the big rock at the Puntledge River. My dad was beside me, advising me of the opportunities. Well, son, you gotta look out of the little windows along the rapids so you can see the bottom of where you're diving to. It's been a few decades since these events took place, and as with any troubles, with time and perspective, I've been able to see with fleeting clarity. I've been able to acknowledge the danger signs. But the doctor was dead wrong about the growing pains. Um, this next one's about uh, getting fired for trying to unionize. <clears throat> uh, it's called Associations. I found a shattered glass mirror, and I squeezed the shards in my hand in hopes that a little blood on my reflection would help me piece it back together. Then I think about the peanuts and peanut butter, how, under a little pressure, they break down individually under the weight of the machine, how it smooths them into a coherent mess. And these days, I find myself spread thin and broken like glass and peanut butter, trying to become whole again. Um, I'm just going to skip to the next one. <laughs> okay, and then I'll button hook back. Okay. <laughs> um, this one's called A Midnight Twelve Top. Like a waitress who has lost her balance, I buckle at the knees from the weight of carrying too many plates. There's a history in these shoulders, not one I've heard, but instinctively know, like an old song in the throat from my forgotten foremothers. I'm speaking with them now. One says, resist. Another, persevere. And another says, learn to fight with your fists. You might need it this year. And above all, they say in unison, above all, remain dear. And I cannot let them down. So I pick up the plates, and I balance them again. There is such a history in these shoulders. Um, this is just a cheeky little one that has the title of the zine uh, in it. And uh, these are available for $5 uh, cash or e-transfer. Or if you don't have uh, $5, I'll just give it to you. I uh, don't really mind. Uh, this last one's called Long Roads. It goes like this. People change, rearrange into strangers. It's alarming at first, but then the danger of having room to grow becomes a joy we share. Pull up a chair. Let's catch up, friend. How are you doing? Where have you been? Thank you so much again for all the lovely performers here tonight. And um, as you stated in your bio, uh, if anyone else would like to perform uh, or be a futures artist, uh, you can talk to me, Taz. I also have social links for forms and stuff to fill out if you want to. Or you can talk to Nana, the lovely shop owner uh, at the front. Um, 
And yeah, I am so glad that all of y'all are here. And I uh, hope that y'all enjoy perusing around here and uh, have a dry and safe, dry-ish <laughs> as possible um, way home. Yeah, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.